Today in the news, we got some comments on Zen 3, some more super, and a failure. What's up guys, I'm Snows, and this is your boot sequence. Let's get started with AMD. We just got the final piece of the uh, Zen 2 based Ryzen 3000 CPU lineup and AMD is already giving us more information on Zen 3, or at least the third generation of Epic CPUs, which is based on Zen 3. Forrest Norod, the senior vice president of AMD's data center and embedded solutions division, had an interview with thestreet.com. In this interview, they talked a whole lot about the uh, integration of Epic Rome CPUs and Microsoft Azure servers and upgrades to Amazon Web Services data centers. But that's not really why you're here, is it? You're here for Zen 3, and it seems like Zen 3 will have a major leap in performance. Forrest Norod started by saying that unlike Zen 2, which was more of an evolution of the Zen micro architecture that powers first gen Epic CPUs, Zen 3 will be based on a completely new architecture. Now, to me, this is already pretty baffling. He's essentially saying that from Zen to Zen 2, excluding Zen Plus, here since uh, it wasn't featured on the Epic platform, it was just an evolutionary upgrade. I mean, he does acknowledge that the IPC boost from Zen 2 was much higher than a traditional evolutionary bump, somewhere around 15%. But him saying that implies that Zen 3 will exceed 15% in performance gains with its brand new architecture. Now that's confidence. Norod also points out that AMD is still working with the TikTok model that Intel abandoned. So technically, Naples was a a tock at 14 nanometers, Rome is a tick since it moved to 7 nanometers, Milan will be a tock since it will stay on a refined 7 nanometer plus process with a new architecture, and Genoa, which should be available in 2021, should be a tick going down, presumably to the 5 nanometer process. I guess we've just stagnated with Intel for so long that I kind of forgot that IPC gains could get so high each year. Intel hasn't benefited from one since Skylake was first introduced. All we got were clock bumps without IPC improvements. And on the AMD side, it just wasn't as impressive since Intel CPUs were still able to keep up. Until now, that is. Norod said, at a time when Intel is promising double digit IPC gains for future microarchitecture, AMD is confident in being able to drive significant IPC gains each generation. Moving on, but sticking with AMD, I've had comments coming in uh, once in a while for an update on the status of AMD's B550 chipset. Well, while we don't have an actual release date, it does look like it's coming really soon. Earlier this year, we heard that Asmedia would start shipping the chipsets to board vendors in Q4 of this year. And well, Vicky Wong, product manager for Biostar, said that not only the uh, chipsets, but the actual motherboards are ready to go. So there's an update for you. In NVIDIA news, it looks like the Super Train is still going strong. After the 1650, 1660, 2060, 2070, and the 2080 uh, got their Super treatment, it's now time for the mobile GPUs to get it too. According to Notebook Check, NVIDIA will introduce a Super variant for the 1650, 2060, 2070, and 2080 mobile GPUs in both Max-Q and Max-P variants. Now, those will apparently not come until March of next year. The reasoning is that AMD might come out with an RX 5700M mobile GPU and that Nvidia is just preparing their stack of super GPUs uh, to compete. Am I surprised? Not really. They'll probably bump the CUDA cores and change the memory in the same way they did to desktop models. In gaming news, it looks like it was real. Half-Life Alex was just teased by Valve themselves on Twitter, which is also their very first tweet. Just like we thought, uh, it's going to be a Steam VR game, so yeah. The official announcement will happen on Thursday at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Also in gaming news, Stadia has made the rounds of reviews for its launch and it seems like it's pretty unanimous. It wasn't ready. It shouldn't have been called a launch. As is, the transitions from devices to devices seem pretty seamless. But then comes the bad. Still too small of a library, pretty much all the features besides device switching are missing. It doesn't work over LTE and if you want to play let's say in a coffee shop or something, you have to bring a controller, a wire, and a phone or tablet which makes you look kind of ridiculous. And of course, the biggest problem of them all, latency. Keep in mind that Google hasn't implemented their negative latency voodoo yet, but apparently um, if you play competitively in games, you will be able to feel the difference. And while I wouldn't mind if I had tons of single player slow paced games to play, 
there are only 22 games total and you have to pay full price for them. Which by the way, three of them are Tomb Raider. I mean, I love Tomb Raider as much as the next guy, but come on, it's too much. Anyways guys, that is pretty much it for the news today. Hopefully you've enjoyed. If you got any questions or comments, you can leave them down below. As usual, you can click right here to see the latest video right here to subscribe to the channel. Stay frosty, my dudes, and I'll see you on the next one. So I broke one of my teeth and um, I don't have insurance, so it's gonna cost me like $2,000 to fix it. So I'm just not gonna fix it.